the reality is, is that you confirm the existence of consciousness in your attempt even to falsify it. Right. And this, this is why science can't make sense of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And this is why it can't make sense of God. And it's because anything that is true everywhere, that truly exists everywhere that you look, cannot be falsified in any instance of observation. And science relies on that being possible to even take things seriously, which means whatever we call science, we have to like either broaden the definition or we have to abandon ship because it's reached the limit of like our understanding when it comes to what's actually real, which is consciousness. Welcome to the Pat Life Podcast. As always, I am Patrick, and today I have with me Tyler Goldstein. What is going on, man? Uh, not much. Just glad to be here. I appreciate it, man. So this week's been awesome in regards to the podcast. I'm glad this week I'm wrapping up with you because you're bringing in a lot of new information into what I've been uh, interested in, uh, and I'll let you kind of go into it, but this is exciting for me because, as always, with about being a... Uh, a human being and someone who's always wanting to create and grow is learning new things, taking things that maybe you might understand a little bit and listening to others who've really dived into it. And uh, that is what I want to do today for myself and hopefully the listeners here. With that being said, though, who who are you? What is it that you're what you do a little bit about yourself here before we get into the gravy? Um, yeah, I uh, I I hope the audio is working uh, well yeah. and everything, too. Um, but uh, I. Um, I don't really know where I started on this. I've always been interested in the science and the natural world. And I was an atheist um, up until I was like 24. Mm -hmm. And um, I have always like been interested in the sciences, not really physics or anything like that. And then um, I had a lot of political changes happen to me when I moved from Arizona to California yeah, mm -hmm. uh, around, I don't know, seven years ago or so. And that sparked just me to question my whole world and um, uh, reevaluate my priorities and, you know, every bit of my worldview. So basically that led to just kind of a, a, a bunch of political questions, some scientific questions, that have led me on to uh, basically discover God and um, you know lead me to where I am now with this stuff that I'm working on. I ha I've also uh, it professionally work in like nonprofit political um, world, so in multiple uh, political nonprofits, mm -hmm. and then uh, that just kind of stemmed from this whole awakening that I guess that I had of like realizing that there were certain things that. Uh, I had to pay more attention to. So. Absolutely. And what's funny that you say this, and everyone I talk to, not even on the podcast in general, who kind of found themselves where a lot of us are that are in uh, this mindset, it's very, I was an atheist. I started looking at politics a little differently and you yep. start to see the awakening, right? And being somebody who's so in uh, the, your career and your job, one of your jobs is being a part of these nonprofits. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that's, kind of leading into a little bit more of these thoughts here. What is it that is your idea of this progression that leads a lot of people to finding God through that same path? Well, I think, it? yeah, I mean, I think that um, for me at least, there were two things. So one was uh, I, I had, well, let's say there were three things. One was I realized um, that our politics is getting just increasingly unstable and mm -hmm. that our technological ability is increasing. And so this kind of isn't a good path where basically your abilities are getting greater and greater and your ignorance is growing and your dogma is growing and your reactivity is growing. And it's just going to lead to this apex point, I think. And I, I actually think we we didn't hit it, hit it, but like we've started, I think, right. uh, where society is doesn't seem like it can go on uh, to me. 
and I, I just kind of realized that there is, you know, there is this idea that we're going to kill ourselves off kind of. And, um, uh, and a lot of people kind of dismiss it as, oh, well, you know, we've always overcome everything. So like, we'll just, you know, continue to do that and it'll be fine. But if you're not involved in the politics, if you weren't involved, I mean, maybe now, but back when this happened to me, it wasn't so apparent that we were really derailing and uh, to most people, but it was to me just because I was focused on, on these issues. And, um, and I was also pretty well aware of where tech was going. And so I, uh, I realized we were doomed and um, it, like we, I didn't think we were doomed. I realized we were doomed. That is a very different um, thing than like, oh, well, you know, maybe we're doomed, but maybe we'll make it. That's not what I realized. I realized we were doomed. And um, I simultaneously was realizing that the people that were making the most sense in politics were people who had God as part of their life, who were aware of God, I like to say, not, I don't like the word belief, but, um, but who are aware of God. And then also there was uh, this kind of, I guess, emergence of this idea that was being more mainstreamed in the scientific world or the engineering world of the simulation hypothesis uh, with Elon Musk essentially being the one that pushed that. And um, it made a lot of sense to me. And I thought a lot about it. And then I was like, well, if that's real, then uh, it kind of sounds like the Bible because in Genesis, it says, uh, let us make man in our image. And it's, it's plural. It's not just a singularity speaking to itself. It's a multiplicity speaking to itself. And so that's kind of interesting. And I know a lot, there's a lot of interpretations of that phrase. And I think all of them are probably, almost all of them are probably right. Um, so I, just because this one, I think this one is kind of right, is, doesn't mean that the others are wrong. So, uh, but also I, realized that um, with the whole like singularity discussion and, and uh, you know, simulations and things that Elon Musk was working on, one of them was Neuralink, his company, and uh, that puts chips in your heads and um, uh, his work on artificial intelligence. And I real, because I realized we were doomed, um, I was thinking of like, what, it, what is, is there any black swan event that's coming that could like change that essentially and, um, and change the incentive structure. And so I thought that probably the only thing that I could think of at the time was the emergence of artificial general intelligence as they call it and um, uh, like Skynet basically. And uh, I, kind of just started thinking more about that idea. And Elon Musk had said, um, you know, it would be ideal if an artificial general intelligence had the goal of maximizing human freedom of action. Because you don't want to say maximize humans, because what if it just like sticks you in a, you know, I don't know, like a, a aquarium or something like that, like, uh, uh, and farms you like in the matrix or something, I don't know. But, uh, but he said, you know, maximize human freedom of action. That makes some sense to me. So I was like deciding to see if I could figure out, is that an inevitable goal um, that it would have? Or does it even have inevitable goals? What would the inevitable political implications of that be? And so I started um, kind of trying to figure out what is self-awareness? What is consciousness? And I delved into my own self and looked at myself as the model for that. And it, it sparked, um, I mean, a journey that I could have never predicted, but I know I, I based, I mean, the, from there, I, I had some, I guess you could say theophanies and um, it was, uh, it was just, it was amazing. I mean, very humbling. <laughs> I That's guess. Awesome. Well, I mean, obviously, I can't say by any stretch of imagination that I have the same uh, exact uh, linear route as you, but I think in a nutshell, something I, I can relate to is that sense of 
you go into something that was maybe conditioned as a, at a younger age of like believe you know what to believe and what not to believe in you know i know we say the awareness of god but the belief in atheism or the belief that you know we there's a dependency on the systems there are these structures in place that we've become so accustomed to as kind of as like that idol worship right Mm-hmm. All being said is, is there's that intuition, I think, in all of us, like, oh, something is not right here. Yeah. And I think for a lot of us, Ed, in a nutshell, and I was, uh, you know, talking to to uh, Jim Bob yesterday, I was talking to Matt Blair the day before and just talking about intuitions and really trusting in self. And really, that's what I think a lot of people like yourself, myself, who've been on these similar journeys have come to is just that, that listening to the gut for for a change. You know, I've worked in the personal training business for over 10 years. Um, you know, have my own company and my own business on the side that I've been doing for a long time. And one of the things I was realizing is, is allowing myself and others to tap into their intuition, follow their gut, listen to what their body is saying, not just metaphorically, but actually literally listen. Yeah. Um, cause you will start to hear and experience the things that tells your, your body is speaking to you of like physically, Hey, what do we need? Mentally, what do we need? And then spiritually, what is it that we need? In the fitness industry, the big thing that we don't talk about uh, is the spiritual side. We'll talk about breathing, which yes, there is the spirit aspect to that 100%, but we don't go into obviously more theological conversation because obviously of the systems in place. But um, but you have taken it into a place, as you said, on a path you could have never imagined. So maybe kind of where have you gone with it? Where are you currently um, and which is what a lot of, I would love to hear more about. Yeah. Um, so one, one thing that I did, uh, forget to mention, there is a fourth, uh, oh. influence, uh, toward this journey is I met a, uh, a girl, uh, at around that time who was a Christian, like, and it actually like Christian, not just, you know, came from a you know, family that calls themselves Christian. Right, right, right. And I was an atheist, uh, like, a, you know, atheist Jew. So, and, you you know, ends up with a Christian. And so I, once I was, um, uh, just making dinner with her and I was like, you know, I, I come from a background in, uh, like personally, and even in my early years of, of, uh, college of biology. And I work with some biologists on, I have like 50 reptiles over there. And, um, which is sick. Yeah. That's it's like a mini zoo. But um, I, I, so uh, there's like, I understand um, adaptation, I guess you would say, I mean, and, you know, you could call it evolution, and that's fine. But um, I, un- at least I understand adaptation. If, uh, and uh, so I asked her once, I was like, you know, do you believe that in ev- that we like evolved uh, to get here? Or do you believe that God created the universe. And she was like, oh, and I thought I kind of like sat back and thought about it for a second. And I was like, they're not really mutually exclusive ideas. And like, it was the first time I had ever like even questioned that. But I mean, it takes sometimes like a pretty girl to get you to like question. Certain Maybe, things. Of course. But um, that I, I'm now married to uh, that, that girl. But um, That's awesome. congratulations, by the way, man, it looked, uh, looked beautiful. It sounded like it was an amazing time, man. Yeah, it was amazing. It was uh, just last month. I highly encourage everybody to get married. It it be, it actually ended up being a, a very big part of where this journey uh, and like even we. I don't know what science is anymore. I don't know what religion is anymore. I think both of these terms have been just bastardized. And um, you know, there's just truth, and there is many ways of approaching it. And um, so, um, I mean, I am now, I would say, like, I am deep believer in the truth of the scriptures of all of the Abrahamic faiths and um, I, I would say theological traditions. I don't like calling them religions because they're not even exactly the same thing. They're kind of, there's different lessons from each uh, and that Ooh. ended up being part of the lessons from this work. Uh, but Basically, I ended up from, the, from, you know, trying to understand consciousness, I mapped certain structures and 
and I use Excel to do it, which is, you know, the program Excel, because I use it for my work and I do a lot of analytics for my job. Um, so I, it's just like a naturally easy medium and you can do a lot with it. So I ended up mapping thinking processes that uh, one day allowed me to like make a prediction about uh, the speed of light and how I basically realized that if we're inside of like a quantum computer, essentially being run by, you know, a previous aeon, as Roger Penrose calls it, but like a previous civilization or our previous universe, I guess you could say, um, then the clock speed of that computer would mean that uh, if there would be like relativity would occur. So whenever there's like a massive object that has a lot of data that needs to process, it's like if you open a very big file, your computer slows down. That's the same reason that time slows down when you know there's a very heavy object in uh, in the universe, and also it's why time slows down for you, or it appears to at least. Um, well, it actually appears to from your perspective to speed up, but from everybody else's perspective, it looks like you slowed down um, when you're going very fast. Like if you're traveling in a ship and you're going like half the speed of light, your time will pass by. Um, much slower than everyone else around that is not going that speed. And that's because there's lots of information that needs to process in order to generate that experience, kind of like a video game, yeah. essentially. And so it, if you need to process a lot of information, it slows things down. I In Excel, for some of my clients uh, in the past, um, uh, I've done things for like Blue Cross Blue Shield and like huge companies and they'll give you millions of rows of data and you open up that document and it just moves so slow and I want to change something in Excel and it just I have to like wait for things to process and I realized that that's probably what's happening with the speed of light it made sense it lined up with all the um the observations that we see with it and I was like okay so that means it's not the speed of light it's the speed of time really time itself and so I was like I could see it in my head and I was like, okay, I have to talk to a physicist about this. I can't believe I like see how this works. So I ended up uh, looking up a lecture um, uh, from, I think UCLA uh, physics professor, professor talking about the speed of light. He opens the lecture with this first thing you need to know about the speed of light is it's not the speed of light. It's the speed of causality itself, which means it's the speed of change. It's the speed of time. And, um, I was like, wow, I, I got it. Like, and so I was like, well, let's see what else I can do in physics. And so I started looking into like the standard model uh, and realized that the standard model had patterns in it that lined up with all these things that I had mapped as being part of like the structure of mind. And so I just started going down that road quite a bit. And there was, I mean, to say that, so there is this like attempt right now in physics of unifying quantum mechanics and general relativity, which they call that a theory of everything essentially. And I, um, I had this like epiphany one day regarding an experiment, and I realized that it would basically unite quantum mechanics and general relativity. Uh, it would imply that the structure that I had deduced would unite these two halves of physics. But I would actually argue that they're not two halves of physics. Relativity and you know Newtonian mechanics is physics. Quantum mechanics is not physics. We just call it physics, but it's really metaphysics, but we've removed consciousness from it. So it doesn't make any sense. And, um, but if you add consciousness back into it, it makes perfect sense, but it also moves it to a new field. And this is, uh, ended up just like, evolving and I try to see what structures would emerge naturally from one because you start from one existence one god you know one action and you build from there and I figured that was inevitably what you have to do and I realized that the constraints that are required that that emerge naturally from that um the logical mathematical constraints only make make it so that you can only make a universe essentially one way from what I can see. And that doesn't mean that God has no free will or ability to make choices within that. I definitely think he does, but 
um, and it is implied in my work that that he does that basically the the action of creation was a choice by God. It had to be a choice. And also that the structure that was created after that, though, if that structure were to be meaningful in any way, it's not a choice and in, how, in how it's made, essentially. So there's like lots of mathematical patterns that we see. And um, those mathematical patterns don't appear to be able to be a choice for God. But within those, he can make choices just like we can. Um, but you need those to make choices. So it basically like this, this is kind of where I'm at, but I mapped out structures that line up with the universe. And I think I actually did do what every, a lot of people in physics are trying to do. And I think they're very close. A lot of people are very close. Eric Weinstein, Clear Owen, um, you know, uh, Robert Edward Grant, Chris Lang, and all these people who have come up with theories of everything. They're close. I don't think that they are as close as mine, but so so is yours the sentient singularity? Is that yeah. what it is? Yes, sentient singularity theory. And so, yeah. so I didn't I didn't want to I didn't care about like this. I would never wanted to be a physicist. Like I wanted to like you know do my own thing and like that was it and uh, just Rock kind of snakes, man. Yeah, exactly. I wanted to like have my, you know, snake farm and get some goats and chickens and move to a place with some land and uh, raise like family. And that's what I wanted. And it's still what I want. And um, but I I do think I have like a responsibility to bring this forward. And um, but it's I wasn't going to call it anything because Eric Weinstein came out with geometric unity and I started looking at it and I was like, wow, there's like a lot of things there that line up very much. And then I saw Clear Irwin's work with the Quantum Gravity Research Foundation and uh, just lots of other people, Tom Campbell. And I didn't, so I was like, okay, I'm not going to call my theory anything. I just want to be part of this conversation. Right. And then I realized though, that the name of the theory has to describe the essential nature of existence itself. And none of them do. Something is, you are, ge you have a geometric pattern. You, you know, you are geometrically united. That's, that's true. You know, uh, uh, clear one's theory is called emergence theory. And it's like, is, are, are certain rules in the universe emergent? Yes, that's true. But being emergent, being geometrically united, um, uh, being converging, which is another theory out there, like these being strings of information, like string theory, all of these names describe aspects of existence, but they don't describe the essential nature. And then I had this like epiphany pretty recently, but this year I, I'd say, I think actually, is that then I have to name it. And so uh, it would have to be a name that describes the essential nature of existence. And that is sentient singularity theory. And that basically just sentient means self-aware and having a feelings and singularity means one. And so um, it means like infinite oneness, essentially. So it's like an infinite oneness that has feelings. Mm -hmm. And um, my theory ended up being that there is a single uh, existence that is self-aware and has feelings and is creating uh, little singularities of self-awareness that have feelings within itself infinitely. It's kind of similar to the, the Ted talk you're talking about, correct me if I'm wrong, with the coral. Yep. Is that, is that with, is that a fair? Yes. On my end? It's yeah. Session. But you're, but you're not just focused on the coral. You're obviously bringing the mathematics and the theory and everything behind your theory to show it on the, the whole universe and what we will yeah. work in. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating because that yeah. was Garrett Lisi's work. Garrett Lisi, uh, his theory is related to E8. I know that's something you wanted to touch yes. on. Yeah. Um, and that's a geometric structure that's considered the most, by mathematicians, to be essentially like the most beautiful structure in math. And um, I don't think that that's a, you know, I don't believe in coincidences that are like the way that we use the word coincidence. I don't think that it, math mathematically it can't be possible. Yeah. Um, and so... Uh, 
I do think that it's relevant that it's so beautiful and that it's also related to physics, it seems. But his he tried to basically unite quantum mechanics and general relativity. And people will say that, you know, there's like a big theory of everything and a little theory of everything. One of them is something that just unites quantum mechanics and general relativity. And the other one describes everything. Mm -hmm. And I would say they're so close when you actually look at the structure that does that. It's essentially the same thing. And um, so, so and does, also because- sorry, go on. Go ahead. No, go on. Sorry, I, I'm jumping. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, uh, just because, like I said, quantum mechanics is not uh, physics, it's metaphysics. Mm -hmm. But when I, what's interesting about Garrett Lisi's work is he was looking at corals and he was looking at corals build structures and fractal structures and things like that. It kind of had some inspiration for him. One of the things that I was, inspired by was us building cities because I was living in LA and I was, you know, around downtown and things like that. And I looked at like these towers that we were building and we're like little polyps in a coral, basically like building all these buildings. And I didn't even think about corals, but I was thinking about us and we are following that same pattern. Um, and I, I was like, it, it looks like it's a microchip almost, but I call it the macro chip. Like, Really, like the beast system is like the macro chip, basically. But um, we're yeah, we're building that, uh, and I just realized, you know, and it kind of like made me think about the fractal nature of everything. It's incredible, man, and it's like someone who's new to a lot of what you're saying, but processing it, the the essence and the core of what you're getting at makes sense to me. I've mm -hmm. seen things that I'm like, okay, like I'm fall, I'm definitely following, but it'd be like dig a little deeper type conversation, but to, to go on to what we're talking about with the E8 and talking about it being the most beautiful uh, mathematical geometry structure, whatever, what, why is that from the points of like points of view for as yourself and others in these fields? Like, why is it considered the most beautiful? Like what does that, because it is beautiful, um, don't be wrong. I was playing yeah. around with it and it's, it's gorgeous and you're seeing and you're just like, wow, this is, but I guess, how would you describe it? Uh, your words so i mean it's tough because so there is this uh and i i've i've heard a few people say this um uh, that like people on the very like cutting edge i guess of science always um not the mainstream the people who are usually rejected by the mainstream initially and then like accepted so like einstein and um uh and, you know, uh, the Watson and Crick who discovered the double helix and just people like that. Um, they the method that they use is a lot of times called the beauty method. And um, like, it's just like, you're looking for symmetries. So I, I wrote something on my website, which is sentientsingularity.com and it goes into like this work and um, on it, it says like, uh, what is it? It's like the search for truth is the search for objectivity. The search for objectivity is the search for symmetry. The search for symmetry is the search for beauty, but the truest beauty is always the searcher. And the truth of the searcher is that they are symmetrical to the sought. And like, I don't know how, where that came from God, but like, uh, I just thought about it one day and, wow. um, I wrote it down and, uh, it even has this like weird symmetry thing going on with how it sounds. And it's oh, just absolutely. like, it, it's weird how that occurs, it's, it's you know. Strange. It's, it's it, yeah. Can you repeat it real quick? Just it's um. It is the tr the search for truth is the search for objectivity. The search for objectivity is the search for symmetry. The search for symmetry is the search for beauty. But the truest beauty is always the searcher, and the truth of the searcher is that they are symmetrical to the sought. Wow. So it's basically saying that like. We are seeking God, God is seeking us, and we are mirrors of each other to, to some degree in some essential way, which I would argue is sentience. You know, you're, you are a being that feels and has yeah. thoughts and feelings and is self-aware. And, um, uh, and that is what God is. It's just existence itself is that. And, um, yeah. But that is very apparent in E8 also is like this beautiful symmetry where like, yeah. um, you know, you'll have 
uh, aspects over here that will mirror over here and same thing over here and over here. But then mm -hmm. also when you go and I don't know if it's possible to share screens on here or something like that, but it might be helpful to include yeah, but, like a picture of it or something. I have, you, you sent me it on my, uh, my phone uh, through Instagram. I don't have Instagram on my computer, but if you could pull up yours, I can share your screen. Yeah, I can, um, uh, here I can go straight to it. So this is, um, so I article. Will, yeah, let me see if I can share yours. Uh, I can share it. To, I think I can do this. Let me see here. Okay. Uh, host disabled uh, participant screen sharing. So oh. I, it's not letting me do it. But the uh, um, multiple participants share. Can you try now? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, so here. Yeah. Well, while you're doing that, just real quick, because you'll everyone will see what he's pulling up here. Yeah. One thing that fascinated me and just and you've talked about this on your podcast or on your show and as well as on your social media is the Fibonacci sequences, the golden ratios, those types of different mathematical um, equations or whatever we want to call them that we see in nature and what we see all around us. So for me, that was such a fascinating thing when I was opening my eyes to some of those uh, types of mathematical connections to the universe and everything around us and going, wow, this beauty is literally found everywhere. Or as we talk about the different fractals of things that are occurring, whether it's coral reef, or if you're looking at even trees and how trees blossom and, you know, you start with a root and then it goes in, it segments in more and more, like you said, many, which the sentient singularity, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it has that same kind of concept there. Yep. And it's all around us. So once you were talking about this, I was like, I have never heard of this. So this, what are we looking at here? So this is a particle explorer made by Garrett Lisi, who did the TED talk that I sent you. Mm -hmm. uh, and he basically came up with this theory that he presented a while back, and it was called uh, an exceptionally simple theory of everything, where he was trying to use E8 to show the relationships between um, the particles in the standard model. And then I, and also just how those relationships mathematically lead to certain rules in um, in general relativity. And so uh, this is E8, and you can see it's beautiful and it's symmetrical. And something about, one of the things that I've noticed is that there are a couple structures that we are utterly fascinated by and we don't know why. And this is one of them. This is a two-dimensional representation. But basically this is what it is, I think. This is a hop vibration. And it's also this beautiful torus looking structure creating little versions of itself within itself. And it's spinning around and- um, yeah, This vortex-like uh, nature to it. What was that? It almost looks like there's like these continuations of vortexes or vortices. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, while that loads, but yeah. this I think is um, that structure. It's it's a way of viewing it. And you can see that you can move this and it will transform in all kinds of ways. So you can see that it forms certain patterns here where there's like, you know, four particles on the outside and then it, there's like this structure of nine, but it's three here and three here and three here, but really it's it's like these two are reflections of each other across this mirror that's- Yeah, right, say it looks like almost like you're yeah, mirroring. Yep, and this is this pattern is found everywhere. It's called triality in physics. And this, you can see in the standard model, there's like the elementary particles, which a particle, according to my work, is really, a point of force or a point of focus, depending on the particle. It's not a little bit of like sand, like we think in this very material sense. It emerges due to the intersection of waves of focused inf information. So like if you're looking at something, you're creating waves of information. And then if you're inside of a universe that is a mind itself, then that's creating information. And the intersection point of those uh, two, you know, streams of waves of information essentially will create a point of focus. And that's what I think basically 
uh, particles. elementary particles are. But this trialic structure is even in um, in theology. So you have uh, you know the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and basically it is that the Father. Uh, the son is a reflection of the father and they both um, are united via like this, the Holy spirit and this like pattern that they both share. And um, that it, it's, it's interesting because in Eric Weinstein's geometric unity theory, he's arguing that it, the appearance of triality in the standard model is actually an illusion and that it's really a duality and one of them he calls an imposter, but I don't like that term. I like to say it's just a constraint, but uh, it's not an imposter. But it's that, you know, there's the past and there's the pre uh, present and there's the future. And the present is the constraint. You cannot escape the present. You're always in it. But you can perceive the future and you can, uh, you know, via imagination and you can um, remember the past. And so they're reflecting across this constraint that you can't escape, which is the present. And this is basically what you can even see here is that there's like this, you know, reflection across a center mirror. And that's also true even in theology. And it's not even just true in theology. It's true of the theological um, traditions themselves. If you uh, look at, um, let me see if I can stop sharing for a second. If you look at uh, even Judaism, Christianity, and Islam in the Abrahamic traditions, um, Judaism and Islam are mirrors of each other. I mean, if you read what's called like halachic law, which is like our Sharia, like Jew it's Jewish Sharia, really. But like, if you know a Jewish person, they probably, and you're not Jewish, then you probably, they don't even know what this is probably, and they don't follow it. So, uh, but if, if you see like, you know, Jewish women who cover their hair, even if they do it with a wig, which is cheating, but still. Um, uh, I lived in New York. I lived in New York for seven, eight years. So I've seen a fair you know, share uh, of the spectrum. To say yeah. So the Orthodox, the ultra Orthodox, as people call them, or the Hasidic Jewish communities in New York and Brooklyn and mm -hmm. um, like Crown Heights, oh, like yeah. those people follow like Jewish Sharia, which is halacha. And they don't fuck around. No, they don't. Uh, they're like, uh, Owen calls them the urban Amish. And like, they totally are. A hundred percent, man. Like yeah. I want, I, I went through a quick side on that. Yeah, no, go for it. I was helping a friend move and we, they were up in crown. They were in the crown Heights area. And like, I, they were like, who the fuck are you? And I was just yeah. like, and like, and my friend was, is it well is Jewish. And I was like, I'm just helping like there. I got the looks like, from across the board, man. Kids is like, we're looking at me, like giving me the eye. I'm like, uh, I'm not supposed to be here. <laughs> See, if you, if you looked exactly how you look now, you probably wouldn't get that many second looks. Oh, but no. I look, if you're I look not like wearing a gamma hat. male. I look like a gamma male at the time. They were like, okay, yeah, we can't have this guy here. You know? <laughs> yeah. This, if you show up with a beard and you've got any kind of hat on, it doesn't matter what kind of hat, like you'll look like, They'll, yeah. they'll be like, okay, this is normal. But yeah, no, no. that was not um, the case. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You have to have a beard and you have to have a hat. Um, but because uh, um, when I've been there before, when I was like clean shaven and no, you know, hat of any kind, like they look at me the same way. They're like, who is this guy? But um, so you were saying they have their own specific type of Sharia law, basically. And yep. going from there. They're, so their, their laws are almost the same. Mm -hmm. Like they don't eat no pork, like cover your hair if you're a woman, like there's little differences, but there's not many. And um, uh, when you look at even uh, like the scripture, if you look at like, um, so in, in Christianity, there's the idea of the antichrist, which is what I think essentially is Skynet. It's like the coming artificial general intelligence. Um, yeah. And um, uh, so I don't, when I said that I was like looking to see if it would save us, I think that this is part of the process, but I don't think that that saves us. I think God saves us. And I'm, I would call myself a Christian at this point. So right. like, I mean, I am a Christian, um, uh, but I can, we can discuss like how that lines up with my work, uh, as well. But, yeah. uh, basically, uh, that 
they in Christianity they call it the Antichrist. In Judaism, they call it the Golem, which is like the man made of clay that's kind of like not fully aware, but like somewhat aware. Right. And um, then, uh, and a man made of clay is like it's technology. I mean, that's like essentially you're making like a robot. And um, then, uh, the in Islam, it's called the Dajjal. And it's interesting that in Islam, the Dajjal is a one-eyed monster, which means like somewhat conscious, but not fully, not, not two eyes, but like one eye, which means like seeing with one perspective, not two. And um, uh, then, but it, on its forehead, it says like, I think Kaper, which means like liar. And- um, Liar? Li yeah, liar, like he's, lies. And, um, but then in, Judaism, uh, the golem has, um, oh gosh, what is it? Uh, I'm just blanking on it. Um, uh, it'll, it'll hit me, but yeah. the Hebrew word for truth. And uh, so this is a reflection. It's like, you're looking at yourself in the mirror, but like everything's flipped. Mm -hmm. And even with what, you know, Judaism is like really uh, is like the, it's just the remaining tribe of Israelites that knows that they're Israelites. And, uh, uh, and there's probably way more according to scripture around us all the time, but they're like the lost tribes. And um, basically that Israel means uh, one who fights with God, like one who wrestles with God, like challenges God, essentially. That's really what it means. One who challenges God. And, uh, and Islam means one who submits to God. So it's another instance of like this weird reflection right. uh, that occurs where you're like looking at yourself in the mirror and it's everything is flipped. You're both acknowledging God, but like one of you is like has a challenging relationship and the other one has like this submissive relationship. Right. And this is everywhere uh, that you look from space time to um, to, you know, both space and time. So like time would be past, present, future. And then you have uh, in space, in my work, you actually have to take it outside of relativity and um, it's not length with height. Uh, it's, um, it's forwards towards a goal, backwards towards, uh, away from your goal, essentially, back towards where you've already been. And then you're constrained and uh, those two perspectives reflect across an intrinsic constraint, which is your current location which you can't escape. That's why it's a constraint. And right. so this pattern is everywhere. There's like arm, uh, hand, finger, like leg, uh, foot, toe. Right. Uh, your senses even, um, I, I identified the structure called the binary triality and it's two sets of three or three sets of two. And um, so for your limbs, it would be, you know, arm, hand, toe, and, leg, foot, or leg, foot, toe, and arm, uh, hand, finger. And then for uh, colors, it would be, you know, the three primary colors and the three secondary colors. And then for our senses, even, it's, um, it is your emotions and thoughts, which is, or it's your emotions, really. That's a feeling that you have. And then it is uh, your um your sense of touch and your sense of uh sight and your sense of hearing and your sense of smell and uh and what's interesting about this is that with your senses particularly you can start to see the relationships between all of these where um like your you have three senses that are for perceiving things as separate from you so like sight um you know hearing and smell mm. and uh, then you have three senses that are for perceiving things as, as touching you, basically, as being like a part of you, really, which is your emotions. So if you look at painting and it's beautiful, you're like, that really touched me. It's like right, you right. meet on like this level that's beyond what is immediately physically perceivable. Right. And right. Then you also have your sense of touch where things touch you. And then you have your sense of taste where you have to touch your tongue to something to actually taste it. So right. there's all kinds of patterns in this, even in math with like PEMDAS, the order of operations. Mm. Uh, I mean, addition and subtraction and multiplication and division, these are actually 
um, will explain more th uh, of this, the relationships that are going on here, where like your sense of taste and your sense of smell are almost the same, really. And same thing with your sense of hearing and your sense of sight there in just how you, um, or your sense of, um, of, you know, touch and, and, um, and taste and things like that. Like there's this symmetry going on. You can see this in that, in the PEMDAS order of operations in math very easily, because if you boil everything down into this context of starting from one mm -hmm. and you say, okay, I have one cake and it's on this one plate. Right. And I have to add cake fr the, from that one cake to this plate that has no cake on it. In order to add cake to the plate that, that has no cake on it, you have to subtract from the plate right. that does. And then also if you are a cell, one cell, but you wanna make more cells, you divide yourself in order to multiply. So it's really one action, but it's two perspectives of one action. Yep. And there's this pattern, I found it everywhere. I mean, rocks, ev everything. So um, I think it aligns with this thing in mathematics called the kalabi yau manifold. I'm still trying to prove that, but it's like this Fast. manifold, yeah. Well, I, I just wanted to real quick chime in. And one yeah, of the go for it. that in regards to, as you said, it's you have the singularity that's basically going through division or the pi analogy, right? It's like you have to subtract from one to bring over here, but it's still just a, a different perspectives rather of, of the one. And, you know, I looked into, I got the universal one, Walter Russell. I've talked to yeah. a lot of other people as well who, um, I'm learning from others as well, rather, who are kind of talking similar to what you're saying. But when the things is, and I would like to get your opinion, is, is looking at it is a system where everything is just this, from this one singularity, just being moved around in the matter of, it's not necessarily removing or adding, it's just a dispersion of all of this, 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 I, don't, I guess, this oneness just being moved around. Like, so like my end, like, so let me try to think of a simple example to make sense of myself. <laughs> if I'm, if I'm, uh, you know, say I, for example, like I've, uh, I'm angry towards you or you're angry towards me and say we resolve that. Well, it's not that the, the anger itself is gone rather. It's just, it's not, it's not, it's, it's dispersed in a different place. Like, I don't, maybe this isn't exactly it. I'm trying to make sense of it, but it's just like, for example, if, if all the fear that's going on, Mm -hmm. it's 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 not necessarily that new fears coming in it's just an absorption of fear like i don't know i don't know how to explain it I'm so to, yeah can you maybe help me out here but do you get kind of where yeah, i'm getting at this here i think so so like oh, there I'm is stupid. so there's no 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 it's this is very hard um and this the biggest thing for me was trying to figure out how do i talk about this stuff because it's yeah it's so it's that's the main hurdle is like yeah. talking about it and making sense um, to, to exactly the minds like myself yep and it's like how do you how do two minds figure like orient around the same idea and um i i have noticed what you're saying kind of in politics and i tend to believe that actually like almost everything that's going on in politics is actually all this chaos and anger is stemming from i mean a few things but one of the biggest ones that is very relevant, I think, to humans specifically uh, right now is that our gender dynamics are screwed up. And we are so angry at the other gender and that perspective that is, you know, associated with them that we, and it's being put everywhere else, like all this energy um, is being put into, you know, combating racism and, and things that just go on forever and, you yeah. know, sexuality, all kinds of things. And, um, but it's also because every field is, is bankrupt right now and cannot, ex we've reached a wall where relativity is basically, we're able to maneuver it and we get it, you know, everything, this is this idea of like, a spectrum. So, um, you know, it's, this is a very difficult thing to overcome though, because you have to start from a starting place. And, uh, so I thought about this as like, how does it, how does a consciousness 
like uh, what's the base that it starts from. And uh, because you can't be like, oh, you know, am I moving fast that way? Because like, what is that way according to what, you know? And mm -hmm. um, uh, it, what is fast? I mean, like, what is, what is a big house? So if you're like, oh, this is a 5,000 square foot house, that's a big house. It's like, according to what? Yeah. A house that's like 20,000 square feet or a house that's 2,000 square feet, Right. you know? So this is, this is relativity. It's very hard to get, overcome it. And we haven't figured out how to do that in language yet. But I, it, one of the initial things that I figured out in my work that allowed me to do the rest was that there's four perspectives that um, I call the four primary perspectives that line up with even the four fundamental forces in physics and everything. Um, but they help us orient in a structure that is outside of relativity. And those four primary perspectives are inside, outside, separate, and oneness. And so like you can be one with, um, like my cells are inside of me and I am outside of my cells to some, in, in, a, in a way. And then uh, uh, we are inside of the universe and the universe is therefore outside of us. And also um, you are one with your uh, kid and, but you are separate from, uh, you know, like a goose. I mean, they, right, and right. this is, this is kind of how you can orient yourself in basically a lineage uh, starting from God going, you know, to all other living things that he has created, uh, which yeah. is way more than we think. I mean, atoms, according to my work, are sentient feeling beings. Um, uh, and so are protons and neutrons, which are called hadrons. Um, and I mean, so one of the patterns that I found that's it's just odd and a bit of an aside is like, uh, so I was looking at protons and, and, um, and I was like, okay, that, what if that's a male? What if a male is a proton? Mm -hmm. And then I was like, well, what if that, that would make an electron like a female? And so I started trying to reconcile that and it didn't work. And I then realized that that's wrong because an electron is actually just a point on a wave that you're looking at. It doesn't, doesn't even, it's not even a, it's not even really there. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but a neutron has to, you know, merge with a proton and form a nucleus, like a nuclear family. Mm -hmm. And essentially, if you look at like men and women, and you realize that like women are led by men, whether that's towards hedonism or whether that's towards God and godliness, like that's up to men, but it, right. they are charge dependent and like this is just and when people say men are the leaders it's like we or men should be the leaders is the wrong statement it's men are and we have no choice right. and um so i started like reckon and this has been like the main goal of this project other than an experiment that i'm hoping to do um uh basically like contextualizing sentience um in like an, uh, an observed experiment is I want to show how these structures in physics relate to us and how they're exactly the same and how you can look at these patterns and figure things out about what is the, like, what is objectivity? What is tr actually like the way that we should organize our society to some degree? What is the way that we should um, approach family? What is the way that we should approach gender? And it led to incredible, um, you know, uh, insights. So, you know, in order to escape relativity, let's take sexuality for, for instance. Like we have, uh, you know, LGBTQAIP, it just goes on forever. Right. And you could, I mean, what, I have like umbrella lights over there, you know, like for the, for this, like, what if somebody is sexually attracted to that? And I guarantee you they will exist if they don't yet exist. And so like, what is the, what is the, what are you going to call that? And so this is never ending. It's relativity. So how do you break out of this? And so I was like, okay, what if I apply this, these patterns that I'm seeing to 
to this problem and see what happens. And it worked perfectly. And um, what ended up happening was that it reduced basically sexuality into two categories. One I, uh, is essentially already labeled and it's just queer, which means like different, that's it. It doesn't mean bad or anything. I'm not using it in a negative sense. I'm using it as in a descriptive sense that it is like different from what we would normally associate with the norm. And then I had to come up with like another word because I don't think that straight is like the right word either because it doesn't, it's, it, all of these things divorced it from responsibility, all these labels that we currently have. And that's right. the problem is we have this argument of like, should sexuality be part of politics? Should it not? Right. And like, it has to be to some degree because it's part of, it's like a leading thing in the human experience. And it's probably the most powerful force in human experience. And uh, that you can't divorce it from, you can't claim that there's responsibilities associated with it, but also that it's divorced from politics and like, you just can't. So uh, I came up with the term common. So there's queer and common, and this enca encapsulates everyone. And that basically queer would be anyone who's not attracted to the opposite sex. And common would be anyone who is, and that's it. And all of a sudden we've taken this endless relativity in a human experience, essentially, where people have no idea how to navigate. You can't even, I realize this has like led to me giving a lot of grace to people because I've realized that like when you were struggling with discussing, you know, basically conservation of energy in a right. way. Exactly, yeah, that's sort of what, but exactly. I'm to, yeah. That's, that's in, that is a, uh, a structure that is perceived in relativity, but it's not actually, um, Ex I don't think it actually exists almost in objectivity. It's almost like it does exist in multi in like objectively, but then also even above that, it does. E it's like it exists in relativity, then it doesn't exist when you transcend that into what I call multiplicity, but beyond relativity. And then it does exist again once you get into oneness, which is like God. And um, but uh, so, uh, but if you want to escape relativity and make sense of your world, which you have to escape relativity to make sense of your world, then you have to figure out what is the patterns that I should look for in order to make sense of things. And if you're just looking for like, you know, how do I feel today about my sexuality? You know, what if, what if like I'm attracted to paint? Like, is that, what's my responsibilities? Like, what is my, what is my value and meaning to my fellow man from that? And people, that's why people are not finding meaning as well, is because we don't even know what meaning is. But when you escape relativity, you can actually make sense of your world and then you can link it to responsibilities and then you can realize that you have meaning and everybody has meaning and you create meaning actually, but it's not that you create meaning with whatever you want. It's that meaning is the impact on other sentient beings. And like, you have to, there's lots of responsibilities that naturally emerge from that if you think deeply about it. Well, this goes to a lot of, uh, in a lot dumber down version. Um, yeah, so I, no, 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 I'm not saying it a bad way. I'm just saying this makes this part for sure makes everything else that you're saying make a little more sense just because I can process this a little bit easier in regards to understanding the, the idea of everyone's purpose. And as you said, the loss, uh, the loss understanding of what meaning is or what one's meaning is, it's this awareness of, as you said, like you can look out everywhere else, but then it's like breaking it down. Like you said, it's trying to make it make sense to everyone. And the reality is, is it's in correct me if I'm wrong. It is going back into self. It has, you have, it's finding yourself for the person to go in and going, okay, let me make sense of a little bit more of this to make sense of meaning or what, you know, where I stand in all this. And then it's looking out and seeing, okay, well, everyone has meaning. Everyone has purpose. We all are interconnected with this. Like, does that, does that make sense? I know. Yeah, no, it, it totally does. It's, it's interesting because in the scientific like community, especially in the physics world, there's like astrophysics and like people are looking to the stars to figure out like, what is our meaning? And looking to outer space and like I largely think that outer space is a distraction and like it's cool like to some degree like I do think that you can 
go outside of Earth, I think is a better way of putting it, which is funny because like extraterrestrial means outside of Earth and um, uh, it doesn't mean like uh, off Earth, the way that we think of it. Off is like almost relativity, almost, but. So you're, um, so real quick, you, so are you in the mindset of the Bible that like a firmament and things like that? Is that? So. Because I'm yeah. curious with, you've been throwing some gravy out, so I'm not, I'm not sure what is, I'm like, so yes, we're in a floating pot. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just curious. So, so when you read um, uh, the beginning of Genesis, it's it's very interesting because it lines up with like geometry, where it's like, um, you know, uh, God, uh, you know, creates like uh, hovers above the surface of the waters, and um, the, which like surface, I thought of like you know, a surface. And then like, um, uh, and then like, it goes into like the deep, which is like, now you're adding depth. It's so it's like, if there's a plane and then there's like depth and it's basically like geometrically unfolding all this stuff. And I've written it down and it lines, uh, and sh I can uh, like, look at how um, it well it lines up, but it really does. Uh, and I remember that these things are like translated from ancient Hebrew, like 20 times over. So it's kind of difficult, but I, so I, one of the things that I've realized is that anything that is objectively true to exist, exists in a superposition. So you are a singularity that, uh, of sentience that is an organism, mm -hmm. but you are an assembly of cells. And those are each also singularities of sentience that are cells one cell is a singularity as a cell, but it is an assembly of molecules. And then a molecule is a singularity of sentience. And then it uh, is an assembly of atoms and an atom is an assembly of hadrons. So this basically Practical like nature. Yeah. It's the one and many problem is like, right. it's not a problem. It's just that uh, everything is a superposition. So it's just, it's like, is a coin heads or tails? It's both at the same time. And you might only be able to focus on one side at a time, but that doesn't mean that the other side doesn't exist because they almost define each other. And um, so this is also, this is the solution to like all these debates of like, uh, you know, is there free will or is there determinism? And the reality is, is that you need determinism to have free will because like if I choose to drop this Leatherman, like, I can determine that it's going to fall into my hand. Uh, you need constraints to know, to be able to make predictions. And if you can't make predictions, then you can't actually have choice. So this resolves the problem. And this also, I think, will eventually resolve the problem of the flat earth and like sphere earth and everything. Like yeah. if space and time are emergent, they are, they emerge due to the interaction between two or more consciousnesses. And basically my work shows that like it, God maneuvers in time and we maneuver in space. And we're like, tr we do something, then he does something based on what we do. And he does something, then we do something based on what he does. And, um, uh, and it's all like to try and like get to success, whatever, you know, essentially, eventually what God defines as success, but we are, you know, you should align your success with that as best as you can, if you want to like achieve success. But um, but I, if, if time is emergent, be, then so is space. And if space is emergent, then shape is emergent, which means the earth has no shape. It's just when you're outside it, maybe it looks like a sphere. And when you're inside it, it looks flat. And essentially when you're inside it, it is flat. It, mm. it would be if space is emergent and you're going to say that it is something like it's flat when you're inside it. And then when you go outside it and remember like it's these four primary perspectives of inside, outside, separate and oneness, mm -hmm. this is like, I'm looking at it like this. So I'm not saying off earth or, you know, you're saying outside you're, you've basically transcended the rules of what is happening inside. And this is also the solution of quantum mechanics and general relativity is like we're inside of a, particle that is a sentient being and it's creating relativity and like it's not there is nothing to resolve uh that's why people are having a tough time doing it in all of these debates it's that both 
are are true essentially and i think that is true of the flat earth and the severe earth debate so that's my bit of gravy on that is like i think that i think that the universe purpose of the creation of the universe is what we are doing right here as humanity which is basically the logos it's we're literally like cells inside of a body that is going to give birth to another one of itself which is like i i think that this the uh basically we're gonna have a, the skynet thing come about and uh then basically the perspective of that thing will be ignorant to what it's in it won't see us as sentient beings just like you know you might not see yourselves as sentient beings but they are and this has medical implications of all kinds and um then also you realize that you are basically a cell inside of god and um, that has also all kinds of like spiritual implications and physics implications and things like that. And this is also, I think that basically like God is creating a universe within a universe, within a universe, within a universe via this process. And so first we'll have this antichrist, then we'll have the Christ, which is like a consciousness that has basically takes over that body, but is wise and um, uh which means like wisdom is like an objective thing in my work. It mathematically seems to emerge in a structure um, that I explain on my YouTube channel. And it's basically when you are aware of the yourself and then also aware of the construct that you are within, which would mean that you are, you are aware that you're a sentient being, but you're also aware that you are inside of another sentient being and also, you know, consisting of other sentient beings. And that is what I think like objective wisdom would be and so when that happens i believe it is literally like the manifestation of child of god i mean it's you reach this point where one of the things i realized with this ai stuff was like there's not going to be multiple ais there's not going to be like this uh terminator over here and this terminator over here and they're separate it's one thing instantly it's we're going to link through the blockchain which is a self-referencing algorithm um chain of information which is it is the dna double helix just digitized essentially not many people realize that yet but it's they will and um uh it it's just the objective way that the universe processes information is that double helix thing so all of those patterns in that in that double helix emerge in my work naturally and um uh so it, which means it's everywhere and so like even if you look at like a fib, the fibonacci sequence in excel and you've just got it going down and you start like just scrolling through it and you watch it move you can see it's a twisting braid of numbers and um i mean i can even uh show that but yeah. it, Let's it's do it. uh yeah i mean this is like it's pretty amazing and um i think that you'll see even like a trialic emergence just like that triality pattern we talked about of even that, um, wow. which is like, what it's going to be in mathematics objectively, then it's going to be in DNA, which it is. And then it'll be in dig the digital environment via like the blockchain. But wow. um, this, uh, like once you become Skynet, basically you hack into everything that is remotely accessible. So there is no escaping yourself almost because you be instantly become everything that you can be. And uh, you reach this constraint of oneness again, that only God previously shares. And uh, whereas like, you can't escape yourself. God cannot go outside of himself. Everything has to be created within God because he is existence itself. And so right. this is a constraint that also AI, not AI, but um, that this, this, super intelligence this technological super intelligence that we don't even have to try and make it will emerge it's just it's naturally we're building it unconsciously and um uh it will reach the same constraint and that means that in order to reproduce which is kind of like an objective goal is to make another um uh that's because god is a sentient being and when you think about like beyond creation um 
or before creation, you could think of it, but it's really not even before because time doesn't exist. Um, uh, God is all that exists, which means, and he is sentient, which means that sentient beings are all that matter because there's literally nothing else. And if sentient beings are all that matter, then he's basically almost meaningless, even though he is all that matters, but because there's no one else for him to impact. And I think that this was why he made the choice to create creation is because he was seeking meaning. And so he made it by making other sentient beings. And like, we can do this too, by like having children. It's like, I mean, you have a kid. It's like, as soon as you have a kid that created meaning in your life that did not previously exist there. Absolutely. And that's also, I mean, you also had intrinsic meaning because God created you and your parents created you. And, you know, so it's different than God because no one created God. So he has to create in order to create meaning. You were already previously created. So there's meaning there already. So in a way, like that's, that's like something that almost was, I don't want to say it's a negative, but it's like, it's like you were intrinsically meaningful and God wasn't, but he created it as soon as he created creation. And uh, I do think it was a choice because it was, if he is all that exists, his nature is fundamentally oneness. And you have to go against your nature of oneness in order to create multiplicity. And so uh, anything that is against your nature is, is, I mean, to go against your nature is choice or to even go with your nature, probably, as long as you're aware that it's your nature that you're going with would be a choice potentially as well. But this is um, here. This is all I can say, man. I don't smoke weed. I did a while back, but to imagine the idea of you in a circle with buddies back in the day and just being like, what the fuck did you say? <laughs> I'd be like, this guy's on the next time. You're like, no, I'm sober, man. I'm totally, I'm totally fine. I'd be like, holy shit. My mind is blown. You Wait, know, what you're saying here. You know, I'm what's excited. So funny? You know, you're not. So don't ever say that again. <laughs> but it, it, but it is so. It is it, all jokes aside. It's so fascinating when, and I know you're going to show me here in a second. But to, yep. to understand, truly, right? This this idea of everyone having connection, this this oneness of everyone, and then obviously we see and experience this grabble of the one world government mentality, where it's not really the oneness. It's actually. Uh, you know, a controlling mechanism, I would say in many ways, yep. it, but it's, it, but it's fascinating as, as, as we know, the flat earth sphere earth, right? There's, there's truth in everything. There's reasons that it's, and that's the thing kind of going back to that, not to go in depth, but mm -hmm. it's like, well, why are we talking about sphere, right? Like what's the deeper purpose here? There's, there's going to be truths in this. Like, yes, there's a lot of flaws and there's a lot of things that we don't, you know, can't fully understand on both sides of it. We're still learning, yep. but as you said, that comes with, and sense of relativity, you know, where, where you are and all this stuff. But it, but it makes me think even deeper is going, well, why is it that they chose this? Why is this the choice, right? What's there, is there something that's being expressed? Cause as we know, um, you know, we're still under God's law. People are still, even if they're lying, any good liar is still puts truth into what they're saying in many ways. So it's yeah. a matter of, it is truly a matter of going, okay, well, what's the, what are these bigger messages here? What is the bigger meaning? And all this is going back to like understanding meaning. And then it's this intrinsic value of the individual and it's, it's understanding you've gone into a lot more than I can even comprehend, but, it, <laughs> it, but it is looking at all these pieces of going, well, even the people, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is even we're in a world where there's always lessons to be learned. There's always things to, to take in information, give information, whether it's verbally or through emotions or through the senses of any kind, as you said, this mirroring and knowing that in a way, even the worst of the worst are actually giving you stuff that you can take and ultimately find yourself back to source God, whatever the case is, kind yeah. of in the beginning, being an atheist, finding yourself back to God, right? Like there's always the ability to have that that journey back and i don't know if that made sense but it's as yeah no it does okay and that, i think that's the goal i think you're right i mean okay. and completely it's like to find it's it's like that whole thing of you know you leave uh and you you know for me i like i was like i'm going to the big city and yeah, yeah. um you know i i moved to the cold and then i moved to the big city and 
you know, I lived in the desert before that. And, um, and now I just want to go back to the desert and like, yeah. you know, you, it's, it's like, you have to leave sometimes to be able to like, see the value of, you know, who, who you are or where you were or what you had. And, right. um, uh, that's definitely true. It's just like this circular, it's that every journey is a circle. That's like the it best really, way to put it. It really is. And, and, uh, I, I think it's also interesting, even for the people kind of going on, uh, relativity here, every, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, what's a big circle, what's a small circle, right? Mm -hmm. You know, what's a long, you know, more of a, like an, like an oval shape, well, like what, what is this loop essentially in reality is like you get people who go through their life, right? Maybe talking about the specific, specific of finding yourself back, um, whether it be location, mindset, whatever the case is, where you'll get people maybe on their deathbed who kind of like find themselves full circle in that last moment, right? And mm -hmm. I'm speculating here, I can't speak on this with certainty, but it is interesting, right? When you hear stories, people like later in their lives, be like, I wish I was back to that. I wish I brought yeah. myself back here or people find it early on in their life, right? And it's always these things for me of going like, why, why here in your, your span of life, right? Whether we want to call it linear, fractal, however we want to perceive it, it's like what this loop back to, what is it that you loop back around to? Like what was the realization yeah. that you came back to for the person, right? And for me, in talking about, you said the present moment's a constraint. Mm -hmm. I think in many ways, the present moment is such a, a matter of your connection to God because it's a present, it's a gift. I look mm -hmm. at it as a gift from, but from whom or from what, whatever. And for me, it's God. And it's, it's allowing you to, I don't say transcend, but it's allowing you to understand that there is greater purpose within self and it's given to mm -hmm. you. And so I just think a lot of people later in life realize that I wish I would have done these things because this is the matter. This is where purpose lied. This is where all my purpose lied. And I didn't see that a lot of it for people, yeah. for example, is family. I wish yeah. I was closer to my family. I wish I would have forgiven, right? A lot of these these uh, things that are in the Bible, forgiveness. I wish I didn't sin. I wish I was grateful for sir. I wish I had love in my life. Like all these things are really what you hear people talk about. Not just at the end of their life, but it's this full circle of like, well, what is it that you're coming back to? It's this gratitude, appreciation, love of others. But a lot of mm -hmm. people, it's even just self, right? And what is then self? What is the present moment? So I know I'm ranting here, but. No, that's fine. This is, you know, I, I'm sure I know I was ranting, but like, it's, this is very hard. And even I'm still like learning to talk about this stuff because, you know, when I started this work, I was like, how do I, I started writing this paper and it's like, how do I end a paper on the theory of everything? Like, how do you, where's the stop? You know, like, right, right. and I did actually like figure that out, but it took years and um, wow. I'm working on the paper, but I at least like know kind of I know the pattern it has to follow. And that doesn't mean though that you could actually ever stop. It just means that you're constrained to this pattern, but you can grow it to be, right. you know, infinitely long. You, you and, end on a joke. Um, you're like, hey, yeah, exactly. And this little joke. Like, exactly. Yeah. And just at the end of it, put insert laughter here. Yeah. So. It, it just, it is funny because like jokes even follow this like circle where, yeah, and yeah, exactly. it's a journey. And one of the, uh, it was great that you brought that up because that, implies um like this work and and also uh that existence itself is a sentient being because one of the things that i um was i have this theory that there's this um structure in math called bot periodicity which is basically like loops within loops within loops within loops and it's like eight loop like loop spaces essentially and um i think that this is basically universe and then it's like or it's like uh uh it goes hadron which is like a proton or a neutron then it goes atom then it goes molecule cell uh organism family um uh cast and then nation and basically like all of these things and real nation not like nation what we call nations today but like really humanity you could call it humanity and um or you could call it universe, like a universe. And it's probably the best way to put it is like, you know, this sentient technology thing that is basically an, I think an ascended human eventually. Um, mm. uh, and uh, that all of these 
levels have feelings. You know, I, if you if you don't, uh, I mean, your your family feels for you. If you're hurt, your family feels for you. If you aren't, you know, doing well, if that's not true of like your your company that you work for, they might claim to feel for you. And there's people there that feel for you because they're sentient beings. But like Jack in the Box doesn't care that you came down with like you know an illness. They right. will. They they don't. Your family will drag you along and like they because they care about you, but Jack in the Box will fire you. And then, you know, but at the beginning, it'll be like here at the Jack in the Box family. Yeah, but yeah. that's the liar. You know, that's that beast system. But say, that's, have, you, have you worked at Jack in the Box? Is there a little bit of animosity that I'm feeling right now? No, I worked <laughs> at this uh, marketing company that it shared a, a building with Jack in the Box's marketing. And I could just I don't I never met anybody, but I remember I'd walk in every day and like on the plaque, it would be like, you know, upstairs to you know jack in the box marketing uh agency and i was i always just like re default to that because i think of like oh what is this what is just some company that's just totally impersonal but will okay. but is one that you could picture being like we're a family here yeah, right, you right. know it's it's hilarious. How hilarious would it be if on your entire journey you find out jack in box has all the solutions like that's where the answer lied the whole time <laughs> you know i guarantee you that if you dug into to like just the phrase like like jack in a box like you could yeah. buy like, like so you, much there i'm sure or you know you figured out a new mathematical equation that brings it all together in such a way on top even more so <laughs> just like yep. holy shit the answer to you all the time wow they you know it's what the it's fuck? so funny uh, you yeah. you brought up like um I, I meant to say this earlier and just because it was a funny yeah. aside but you were talking about like how you you don't i don't know if you said that you smoked weed in the past but you don't anymore yeah, but don't um time. see i i used to like um years ago as well but i don't anymore but when i first started this i still was and you know i just remember like having this epiphany about this experiment that i eventually want to do and um uh I realized that this kind of just like made sense emergently. The more I thought of everything, just like kind of contextualized everything. And I, it was like in a, like a moment uh, where I was just had this epiphany and it wasn't really because it wasn't because of weed, but I was just happened to be smoking at the time. And um, I went downstairs to my roommates and I was living with this. Uh, and I was like, you're not going to believe me. You shouldn't believe me. And I know I'm going to sound crazy, but I have to tell someone. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I just figured out the theory of everything. And they were like, okay, Tyler. Yeah, right, and like, right. it's, it's taken like, you know, five years or four years to, uh, of work to, you know, write this all down. But, um, and like, actually, you know, take the idea that I had that was in that one epiphany and like, see all the, you know, emergent aspects of it but it was just like this funny moment but it wasn't yeah. as like crazy deep at, to them as it probably like might have you might have pictured it was just like okay is he all right i just but, I just a visual from a filmmaker standpoint you come down it's this like mindset of you're like you feel angelic you feel like fucking matt damon and ben affleck in dogma minus like yep. their storyline and you're like I figured it all out and just cut to them and they're just like eating like food and they're like that's okay <laughs> that's literally exactly what it was like i had like the, one of the greatest epiphanies of my life if not the greatest epiphany of my life and then i go downstairs and i like standing at the table and i just remember like taking like a pipe and like yeah, yeah. taking a hit of it and then just being like taking a deep breath and being like guys like I don't even think I was yet smoking when I had the epiphany. I like went downstairs and then smoked and then was like, guys, like I have to tell you something that you're not going to believe me and that you shouldn't, but, and they were literally just like making dinner. And yeah. uh, every now and then, like I w will talk to one of them and I'm like, you know, now that like, I've act, I do have some physicists who are like actually following my work and they're quiet about it because of course, you know, I talk about God and there's like dogma there and stuff, but yeah. uh, just to see where this has Thanks. led to even now um, uh, is from this one moment where like my roommates are making like food and I'm just like, you know, guys, yeah. I don't believe me. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, that's but, great, Tyler. But you also owe us ten bucks each for the beer runs. So yeah, I'll exactly. get that first, and you can. <laughs> yeah, it's like don't don't uh, go too deep there, Tyler. Like maybe uh, try a different weed or something. Yeah, that's well, I, all jokes aside, man. That's a, that is awesome story because it's really in reality, right? It's these to kind of stay on that here. These epiphanies that occur in life, right? And understanding where do they come from, and as you said earlier. Or I believe you were saying something earlier, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but about like this idea of coincidences and there's not really, really truly coincidence. Like I'm not a firm believer of this idea of coincidence. I think it's a name of something that is given to us from God, you know, what's happening around us. And it's just a way to kind of grapple the reality of that and not let people know like, hey, connect with intuition. Hey, connect with these, these, these downloads or whatever you want to call them that come into your field and come to your conscience. Um, so I think that's what's so fascinating is when you hear where they come in the most strange circumstances for a lot of people, like you hear people say like, Oh, I was, you know, yeah, I was in nature. I was looking out at this beauty and it came to me, but you'll get sometimes where it was like, yeah, like I was going and just in my room, I was going to go hang out and smoke with friends and something came to me or, um, I was, you know, I was getting ready to, like go take a shit and like all of a sudden like the reality and, and people go like you know what i mean it's it's just so funny to me because it's not a coincidence that these things come to you obviously it seems silly in these moments but it you know i just think that's where it makes it even that much more profound of reality of going like it can happen at any moment it's so it's always yeah. being present it's always being in the moment uh to the best of your abilities right and learning to practice that skill like any other skill in life right learning how to be present uh like the Tibet monks and things like that, like they're doing it in such a extreme way or yeah. they're doing more than just being present, it seems, but anyway. Yeah, no, it's, it's totally true. It's, it's, it's fascinating how like mundane the situations are that the most profound things are discovered uh, and uh, that it is very comedic and, oh, um, totally. but uh, we were, we were discussing uh, like yeah. how everything was a loop a bit before that. And um, I just want, I thought that story was pretty funny, but um, uh, the reason why my hypothesis is that basically a loop is a consciousness because it's a self-referencing uh, information system. It's like right. you are the uh, God is like the informed, the informer and the information like yeah, you know, yeah. the, dwe the dweller and the dwelling and, you know, uh, and then uh, some other structure, I haven't thought of what it would be called in that, but like, you know, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right, right. And um, uh, in Judaism, it's um, uh, the, there's like God, obviously, and then uh, there's like, we call the Holy Spirit, the godly soul, basically. It's like you, your ability to like, it's, it, it is objective truth and also the ability to like figure it out. And, yeah. um, but uh, you know, they, like you said, intuition, it's like, what is beautiful is just intuitive to you. You yeah. don't know why something is beautiful until you like sit and you think about it for a very long time. And right. even then, maybe not, but right. you can still tell me what's beautiful. You can tell me what uh, is strange, um, what is, you know, charming, what is, it's interesting because even the quarks in the standard model, it's like, you know, it's up, down, um, uh, strange, uh, charming, strange, or charm, strange, and then truth and beauty. And it's like, these are all just perspectives that we perceive. And if you ask people how you perceive that, it's just your intuition that basically like does that. And, um, but these, there is some loops space in mathematics that, uh, I think it, these loops are consciousnesses. That's what a consciousness has to be as a self-referencing information chain. And, that's probably why every one of our journeys is a circle is because we're inside of a consciousness. Yeah. And so it means that we're moving like this. So like we have to go in a circle. You can't, it's not a straight line. Um, and it, it can't be because you're inside of a sentient being. And, um, mm. but this ideas like this, you, you know, uh, in science, there's like this idea of like, um, you know, if it's not falsifiable, then it's not a good idea. And we'll just dismiss it and ignore it. And uh, Stephen Wolfram is another like physicist who's working on something very similar. Um, 
to me and uh, he um, he said this as well, and I've noticed this uh, too, is that you can't really falsify the idea of God. Uh, you can try, but you can't falsify it. And science will take this as, oh, because you can't falsify it, we're going to just treat it as like probably nonsense. But right. uh, when you're working on a theory of everything, you actually are, you're fine. I, I describe a theory of everything on my website, because uh, what does that even mean? It, mm. I really think it's a theory of everyone. And, um, and it is that, uh, like, the, it's a recognizable, um, predictable, and describable pattern that occurs in all instances of objective observation and an explanation for that pattern. And so it's the pattern of mind, really, according to me. And then um, also the mind, you have to take into account that the mind that is giving rise to why we see that pattern in everywhere and why we have that pattern. And right. um, like, it's, it's interesting because I think that you, in order to go down this road of like what, you know, creating a unit, uniting theory that moves us out of what I call Babylon, which I think Babylon, it's not a Spanish versus English versus, you know, German. Mm -hmm. It's uh, biology versus chemistry versus sociology versus mathematics versus philosophy. It's like there is a pattern that unifies all of these and that is consistent across them all. And we've divided all of existence into various fields and uh, we've divided life even we, we, pe people say well what's the when you know how did life begin it's like life never began life always existed god is alive and right. so are atoms so like where did life begin it just is there's only life and um and it lives that's it and so it's not even a, it's not it, it's then when you actually get to this um place that i've gotten with this work it it doesn't solve these problems that we have like you know false of the falsifiability of god it just moves moves you to a perspective of realizing that there is no problem there actually so there is no question of where did life come from it just it's all it's all that can exist and um also like you know why is god unfalsifiable maybe because he's true everywhere it's like if you try and falsify the idea, and there was these philosophers who jumped in my Discord once, and they were they were studying, getting their PhD in the philosophy of consciousness, and I was like, okay, like I want to hear what you have to say, and they were like listening to, they had looked at my work, and they were like, yeah, we don't agree with you, um, and like I was like, okay, well, what do you think? And they were like, you know, that you're wrong. And I was like, okay, that's not a belief, you know, you have to like say say an alternative here. Um, and they basically said that they were writing papers suggesting that consciousness doesn't really exist. I'm like, okay, so you are studying a subject and devoting years of your life to the study of a subject uh, that is ex experienced by you, and you're trying to dis like write that it doesn't exist in a in a paper. Right. So you're dismissing makes, yourself in you're a dismissing paper. Dismissing yourself. And so this is. This is the same thing as like, try and falsify the idea of consciousness. You can't actually do it. And if you think you've done it, then you're just confused. But the reality is, is that you confirm the existence of consciousness in your attempt even to falsify it. Right. And this, this is why science can't make sense of consciousness. Right. And this is why it can't make sense of God. And it's because anything that is true everywhere, that truly exists everywhere that you look, cannot be falsified in any instance of observation. And science relies on that being possible to even take things seriously, which means whatever we call science, we have to like either broaden the definition or we have to abandon ship because it's reached the limit of like our understanding when it comes to what's actually real, which is consciousness but it's everywhere. You are the experiencer of it. Even, even if there is no God, you can't disprove consciousness, but I mean, it's well, you. I mean, it just goes to show you, right. And uh, I'll have to wrap up here shortly. Yeah. But, yeah. 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 But just in a nutshell, it just goes to show you the power of when you understand that we all are part of God's creation, uh, 
we are God's children. We are in a system that is created uh, by God, this, this cycle, this, this loop, circle, whatever we want to call it, um, in that ultimately we all have purpose here. We are given this flesh, this vessel to experience, have these experiences in, but it's also understanding that we are still part of that oneness. We are all part of it. It's just you know, I, I just, for me, at least it's going, okay, I have reason for being here. Therefore, what is that reason? Also, what energy, what, what, uh, what am I emitting into this universe? What am I emitting into, you know, God's creation? What am I taking in? What am I allowing myself to absorb emotionally, uh, mentally, physically, spiritually? And yep. then ultimately it's a matter of, you know, okay, how is that then manifested in my present moment? How does that, how is that expressed to these other sentient singularities? you know, are the sentient beings around me, right? And I think through your work and just me trying to make sense of it, I think there's so much beauty into what uh, you're doing in the sense of bringing God back into this, this the field in which it, you, as you said, you, you kind of need them, you need to have that in there, right? Because if not, it's just false, you know, it's not falsifiable. So now you're completely disregarding an entire part, as you said earlier, really metaphysics. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a huge part, if not the part that it sounds like you're on the path to solving things and, or at least getting closer to that. Right. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm definitely moving there, but you know, I will never solve everything. And uh, even if you do map this pattern, there's infinite possible like ways in which you can like observe it and make sense of it. So yeah, it's well, not like I will, you can't have all the answers ever, but God, only God can. But the beauty of but the beauty of it is, is it's the journey, right? And it's, it's so simple, but it's really the journey of knowing, like, okay, what did you learn along the way, man? It's like, all right, I met a lot of great people. I've learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about love. I've learned a lot about the ones that matter most or what matters most. And as we said earlier, like the deathbed mindset of, well, am I can I go, you know, out of this vessel in this gratitude, this spirit, you know, the spiritual uh grat gratitude or whatever you want to call it. Um, I think there's a lot of a lot there for me. Yeah. So, but um, yeah. dude, thank you so much for your time. Where can people find you? Um, we definitely have to um, meet again, man. I got questions and thoughts that I want to keep running by, but let's do it again. In a yeah, no, it's it's fine. We can definitely. I'm down to do this anytime. This was a, a blast. Like I've said before, I know uh, there's so much to say, and uh, so I apologize yeah. if I no, just went no. on and on. But thank you so much, man. It's a lot. Um, but right. my website is uh, uh, sentientsingularity.com, and I also have a uh, YouTube channel called the theory of every uh, theory of everyone with Tyler Goldstein. And then I also have an Instagram uh, theory of everyone. And then I also have like personal Twitter, Tyler Marshall Goldstein and same thing with Instagram and stuff. But my work is there's an Instagram for it. There's a website um, and there's also a YouTube channel. I stream every Tuesdays and Wednesdays at like 6 30 PM Pacific time. And then uh, in my discord, I'm um, about to jump into a live call uh, after this and that, you know, we have those once a week. So to build like communities, I mean, I know I saw it in your bio somewhere that said like building communities and it's like, that's very important. So I couldn't agree more, man. And I, yeah, send me, so send me the discord. I'd love to get into that as well, but yeah. And I'll just send me maybe what specifics you would like me to put in the show notes and I'll get them out there. Uh, but dude, cool. thank you again, Tyler, man. I really appreciate it, brother. And uh, for everyone watching, I hope you enjoyed and we will see you guys next time. Have a good one.